FKA Twigs, A Pallian Perspective. I've been reading a book that was first published in 1990 called Sexual Personae, Art and Decadence from Nefertiti to Emily Dickinson. The author is Camille Pallia. Now, Pallia is a professor of art and humanities, but she has been in the public domain ever since Sexual Personae was a bestseller. A self-described dissident feminist libertarian, she's known for her polemical style of writing and a rapid fire speech, often utilizing her comprehensive knowledge of art, history, and popular culture to dismantle her opponent's arguments with extreme precision, often injected with humor and controversy. I was reading the second chapter of the book titled The Birth of the Western Eye, in which Pallia argues that Western beauty and aesthetic has been formed by the ancient Egyptians, who were the first culture to fuse paganistic earth cult subdued in nature's metaphysically blinding primitive forces with a component for the visual. Quote, Egyptian culture was a fusion of the conceptual with the Chthonian, the form making of consciousness with the shadowy flux of procreative nature. Day and night were equally honored. Here alone in the world were sky cult and earth cult yoked and harmonized. So Pallia defines beauty as our weapon against nature, with limit, symmetry and proportion acting as the primary instruments in capturing beauty. She purports that beauty was made by men acting together through cities like hamlets and forts, spreading across the Near East after the founding of Jericho in 8000 BC. But quote, it was not until Egypt that art broke its enslavement to nature. Now this is all quite academic. So from my understanding, Pallia views the omnipresence of nature, which is default and without intention, as the cloth for which we cut art and beauty from using what she would call the Apollonian eye, giving us the utility of conceptualization and projection. To support her argument, she contrasts the Venus of Willendorf, a tiny statuette from the Stone Age around 30,000 BC with the bust of Queen Nefertiti. Venus of Willendorf represents the swampish, imperious, prison-like force of procreative nature, what Pallia refers to as the Dionysian. Bulging, bulbous and bubbling, her facelessness is the impersonality of primitive sex and religion. Now here lies a lack of identity. Woman is nothing but a symbol of fertility. She is fat in a time of famine, suggesting not indulgence, but good health and access to food. She is surviving. There is a lack of feet so as to be incapable of leaving the land. She must stay in order to continue the breed. She is the prisoner of her own body. Nefertiti is the opposite of the Venus of Willendorf. She is the triumph of Apollonian image over the bumpiness and horror of Mother Earth. She symbolizes Western culture, moving away from the Dionysian night towards Apollonian sunlight. As the Venus of Willendorf is the cloth of nature, we cut out Nefertiti through a process of metaphysical reduction, seeking definitions and linearity. Pallia goes on. I said, Egypt invented elegance, which is reduction, simplification, and condensation. Mother nature is addition and multiplication. Nefertiti is subtraction. What struck me most whilst I was reading this chapter is my shrine to FKA Twigs' album and EP artwork, unconsciously placed above my living room mirror to invite reflection and contemplation. So in this video, I will examine each image, each cover artwork from EP2 up to Magdalene, and I will be looking at it through Pallia's perspective, looking at how they correspond with or even invoke the image of Nefertiti. I posit that the chronology of the four images indicate a regression from Apollo to Dionysus. As I talk about each artwork cover, I will take direct quotes from Pallia where she is talking about the bust of Nefertiti. So, hmm. So we'll start with EP2. Say that again. So we'll start with EP2. No. So despite Twix actually having an EP before EP2, her first EP, funnily enough, was titled EP1. Uh, this didn't actually have a portrait of Twix on the image, so we're going to start from EP2 and work our way towards Magdalene. So in reference to Nefertiti, Pallia states, quote, with his slim aristocratic neck, Nefertiti is a pillar a caryatid. I'm not really sure if I say that word correctly, caryatid. I had to look that up in Google, not gonna lie. And it means like the pillar, pillars in Greeks. 
Creaky pillars. Ah. Should I do the whole thing again? Okay. With her slim aristocratic neck, Nefertiti is a pillar, a caryatid. Now you would be forgiven if you did like me and quickly Googled what a caryatid was, because uh, I didn't have a clue. But Sorry, it's. Then that didn't make sense. If you did like me. If you did like me, yeah. Did it? Yeah. Oh. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. If you did like me. Yes, it does. Maybe in Wales. Well, I'm Welsh. Uh, and it actually means, it refers to the pillars in Greece being long and thin in construction. So, here's AP2. The first thing you notice when looking at the image is the elongated neck, which has been digitally manipulated to an unhuman-like form. This vertical augmentation is twigs aiming to reach the optimal metaphysical level. Head magic, as Palia dubs it. The peak of the pyramid. It's a strife to move away from Mother Earth's simultaneously creative and destructive belly magic, a move towards form, its linearity and projection, a higher goal than what our brittle, finite bodies condemn us to. To quote one of my Agairus tracks, my body cloaks the universe in me. Halia quotes, Nefertiti, she is forbiddingly clean. Now the bright, purifying white background of EP2 encroaches on the earrings, making them barely visible. This light flows down the cheeks, around the chin, down the neck, across the collarbones, and across the shoulders. The neck is made slimmer through this light. Palia states that Nefertiti's head is so massive it threatens to snap the neck like a stalk. Now I am reminded of the Water Me video, to which EP2 is the parent album, where Twigs' eyes and head are inflamed. Quote, Nefertiti is a royal highness, propelling herself like a jet into sky cult. Now, we cannot see Twigs' eyes because the pillar neck propels upward so much that it places them just out of the frame. The precision of the cut across the top is an Apollonian line. As Palia says, quote, in the cult of the eye, the Egyptians saw edges. This slice is so severe and perfect in absolute terms, twig sacrifices revealing the forehead to convey the impulsion for sky cult transcendence. She has traded sight for vision. Quote, Nefertiti sees more by being less. Mutilation is mystic expansion. Palia states that with a, quote, forward thrust, Nefertiti leads with her chin. Now, this slicing of the eyes on EP2 makes Twigs' lips and chin the focal point, with the deep burgundy of the lips presenting the only splash of colour on the whole image. Quote, naked yet armoured, experienced yet ritually pure, Nefertiti is sexually unapproachable because bodiless, her torso is gone, her full lips invite, her perfection is for display and not use. Now with EP2, the face is fixed with absolute symmetry, that the digital trickery is practically unnoticeable without diligent examination. Now it could be the left or the right side of the face, but one side has been horizontally flipped to form the perfect symmetrical pose. Her lips have identical indents just above the teeth. Symmetry is the ultimate form of reduction to nature's overabundance. As Palia asserts, quote, Nefertiti is femaleness made mathematical, femaleness sublimized by becoming harder and more concrete. Moving on to LP1. Quote, the bust of Nefertiti is artistically and ritualistically complete, exalted, harsh, and alien. Now by complete, we infer to an image that has absolute precision in its reduction of nature's excess. Palia said, the idea of beauty is based on enormous exclusions. So much is excluded from the Nefertiti bust that we can feel its silhouette straining against the charged atmosphere a combat of Apollonian line. Now in comparison to the other three album and EP covers, with their extra cranial body parts protruding around the frames as shoulders, collarbones and arms splay out, LP1 displays the skull in complete isolation to the body. To Palia, Nefertiti, quote, seems futuristic, with the enlarged cerebrum. Venus of Willendorf is all body, but Nefertiti is all head. His shoulders have been cut away by radical surgery. Is it left or right? Is that right? Uh, or was it that way? Does it read? Do you know what I mean? One's left. That's left. So that, okay. Yeah. You may notice it's getting a little bit lighter and that's because the Apollonian sunlight realizes my speech. <laughs> realizes I'm heading, seeking out transcendental knowledge for twigs 
And so it supported me by brightening the room. Anyway, the angle of the camera shot for EP2 focuses on the neck and shoulder blades, whereas LP1 shows the entire face. Comparing side by side, there is a movement downwards in order to reveal Twix's full head, hinting at the gravitational Dionysian pullback towards nature. Now we see hair for the first time, the human equivalent of animal fur. It is tightly preserved in two ringlets on either side of the head, and yet there are two stray hairs caressing the forehead, almost with a sweaty texture. These are the first signs of Twiggs's human animalistic form that she inhibited amongst the airy gloss of EP2. Despite the lack of visibility, we know there is a body. A body owned and controlled by primeval Mother Nature, no matter how much we attempt her escape. The most obvious expression of this is the purple-red colouring that swathes across Twiggs's face, creating a bruise-like effect. Despite the ceramic texture of the skin, which attempts to portray Twiggs as a lifeless doll-like figure, the, bru the, bruise, blah, blah, blah. the bruise portrays this attempt, lifting the curtains on the trickery by revealing that there is, in fact, blood within the skull. Quote, Nefertiti has the face of a mannequin, static, posed, and self-proffering. For LP1, there is an attempt at symmetry, but its precision does not match the Prudessa's artwork. Her head is slightly tilted and her eyes ponder to the right with gentle rumination. In spite of the endeavour to remain expressionless and conceal the human pain of whatever physical blow to the head she has experienced. The image background is blue, a far cry from the Elysium white and clarity of EP2, implying the intrusion of depth and mystery. Now on to Melissa. I come back to the common theme. Mutilation is mystic expansion. The artwork for Melissa has clear mutilation as a hand forcefully invades the face, blocking up the eyes. It's as though we have just caught the snapshot of a mutant combat. If head is sky cult Apollonian magic, then hand as extension of arm and body is Chthonian nature. As Pallia exerts, Dionysus, as Apollo's antagonist and rival, represents the obliteration of the Western eye. There is an eruption. We don't know who the hand belongs to. It could be Twigs's or it could be belonging to anybody else. This element of the unknown awakens our sense of the surrounding to the portrait. Nature's excess cloth is signaling her presence. The hair itself has loosened further than LP1. There are multiple earrings that are now fully visible. Twigs is pierced. She has skin with a hollow wound, unlike the china material of LP1. The background has fallen from a surface blue to a pure black, home of the underbelly, back to the womb. Twigs correctly describes Melissa as her feminine energy. Dark, elusive, capricious, bending and molding matter in eternal metamorphosis. Finally, we go on to Magdalene. Quote, the proper response to the Nefertiti bust is fear. The queen is an android, a manufactured being. She is a new Gorgonian, a bodiless head of fright. Now by Gorgonian, Pallia is referring to the Greek Gorgons. Typified by a female head with snakes in her hair, Gorgonian translates as a bodiless head of fright, which Pallia asserts was the origin of the Gorgon myth before the Perseus legend appended a female body. Twigs has her hair pulled back, as if there is an attempt to contain Mother Nature's beasts. But despite the reluctance to bear her true self, a serpent has freed itself from the nestle. Mouth agape, it's ready to strike. One cannot gaze upon the Magdalene artwork without conjuring the image of the Gorgon, particularly the infamous Medusa, who shares resemblance in name to both of Twigs's feminized album titles. Now the Gorgons had the ability to freeze men into stone as they meet the eye. Twigs intentionally side eyes us and avoids our glance in order to allow us to engage with the image in contemplation. There is a sympathy she affords the onlooker or apathy to a more discerning set of eyes. The color of her skin is overblown, whereas the background is of a natural homo sapien complexion positioned as if to highlight the contrast and overcompensate on the reptilian effervescence. The fragmented skin is made of large brushstrokes. The absence of meticulous accuracy connotes Twiggs' return to nature, the blotchiness and unrefined mess of the Venus of Willendorf, a return from Apollonian day, order and control to the Dionysian chaos, the archaic night. Throughout Magdalene, Twiggs makes references to a return to Earth, the music video for Cellophane is littered with images of her descent from Apollonian sunlight to the mucky underbelly of Chthonian Earth. 
the Chthonian realities which Apollo evades, the blind grinding of subterranean force, the long, slow suck, the murk, the ooze, where she is embraced by elder maternal creatures who massage earthly matter over her body. This gravitational pull is mentioned across the album. Twigs is a fallen alien. In Home With You, she is running down the hill towards home, back to Mother Earth, where she visualizes black. As an only child raised by her mother, I've always suspected that the lyrics to this song is about her returning to her mother. The most conspicuous and yet perplexing image of the Magdalene era is the conclusion of the Home With You video. Twigs pulls a child version of herself from the hidden murk of an isolated well, where the child instinctively lifts Twigs' torso to reveal a single eye over her belly. Looking back over the whole video for a second viewing makes you realise that Twigs is seen wearing a blindfold over one of her eyes the entire time. Now what does it, all of this mean? Pallia explains that the bust of Nefertiti is one of the most popular artworks in the world, replicated time and again on pendants, scarves, coffee tables, etc. However, Pallia has never experienced the bust reproduced exactly as the actual bust. As she describes, is intolerably severe and too uncanny an object for public display. She goes on, the bust is usually posed in profile or at an angle so that the missing left pupil is hidden or shadowed. Twigs, like Nefertiti, has lost her eye, her Apollonian eye, and yet mutilation is mystic expansion. The eye has descended from head magic to belly magic. Twigs, like the Venus of Willendorf, is a prisoner of her own female body, a body susceptible to nature's uncompromising brutality. Twigs knows this firsthand, suffering from fibroid tumours, apples and cherries, in her uterus. The western eye of conceptualization has transferred to the belly as Twigs has gained a full comprehension of the power and vulnerability in her femaleness, both physiologically and metaphysically. Twigs' adoption of pole dancing for this era also highlights this self-awareness. Talia suggests that sex crimes are predominantly a male phenomenon because such crimes are, quote, conceptualizing assaults on the unreachable omnipotence of woman and nature. Every woman's body contains a cell of archaic night, where all knowing must stop. This is the profound meaning behind striptease, a sacred dance of pagan origins. Erotic dancing by males cannot be comparable, for a nude woman carries off the stage a final concealment, that Chthonian darkness from which we come. Woman's body is a secret, sacred place. It's worth noting the titles of each album and EP. We begin with simple and concise letters and numbers with EP2 and LP1, an alphanumerical construction, an Apollonian design in order to make sense of mystical nature. And we transition into Melissa, which still utilizes a consolidation of letters and numbers, but in an incomprehensible way. The attempt at control is loosening and fragmenting, a feminine name forms. Chthonian nature is beginning to assert her dominance until we eventually arrive at Magdalene. Nature is messy and unpredictable and omnipotent. No matter how much we attempt to free ourselves from her clutch through the Apollonian Western eye via mathematics, philosophy or art, she always wins. Ever present, ever powerful, always on her terms. As Twiggs proclaims, true nature won't search to destroy if it doesn't make sense. Nothing about Melissa or Magdalene's cover art aims to make sense. Twigs is capitulating to nature for survival. Okay, so in conclusion, Twigs is Queen Nefertiti. Her aesthetic takes after the Egyptian model of fusing Apollonian projection and conceptualization with Dionysian mysticism. From EP2, where she requests that her lover water me for growth and expansion of the personality, to Magdalene's fever for the fire, destructive and all-encompassing. Even in her pseudonym, she holds these ideas. As humans who seek meaning out of patterns, her fans have attributed FKA to formerly known as, but Twigs herself has confessed that FKA has no meaning. Presented capitalized and obstructive on the tongue when pronounced, they are a random collection of letters, an attempt at throwing the tools for the construction of language at the wall to see what sticks, with the sharp phonetics bouncing back. And then, the all lowercase twigs, nature's messy, brambly fingers. There is no capitalization because there really is no hierarchy in nature. We all eventually succumb. Memento mori.
FKA makes a steadfast approach of defining each letter individually. Twigs swirls off the tongue in unison to the fluidity of nature's excesses, avoiding form or shape. FKA Twigs! FKA Twigs. Please welcome FKA Twigs! Now to me, FKA Twigs is one of the most pioneering, most visually stunning artists of my generation. Palia submits that Egyptian images made Western imagination, and I see Twigs' futuristic, experimental imagination is fully informed by the visual aesthetic of the ancient Egyptians, what one could call a woman's sacred geometry.